Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. I know our vegetable garden doesn't look like it's ready to be planted, but there's a whole lot of planning going on here. If you are a brand new vegetable gardener or someone who has grown veggies for years, I'm going to have all sorts of useful tips for you in the coming weeks. But first I should introduce myself to those of you who are new to my channel. I love vegetable gardening and I grow everything organically. It is so easy to do. My husband Bill and I live in Spokane, Washington, which is about 300 miles east of Seattle, and we are in Hardiness Zone 5B. I am the longtime Sunday Garden columnist for the Spokesman Review newspaper here in Spokane, and I've been a Spokane County Master Gardener for 21 years. I'm the author of the Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, which is all about the good and bad bugs we encounter in our gardens, how to encourage more beneficial insects, and how to organically control the damaging ones. I'm also the author of the new book, The Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook, which covers all of the puzzling and challenging types of things we gardeners occasionally deal with extreme weather conditions, we're all seeing a lot of those, right? Germination and pollination issues, vegetable plant disorders and diseases, and even critters in the garden. This book will be out on February 7th. As you can see, our garden is still covered with a lot of snow, but there's still a lot of plans to be made. And I have to tell you, there is a layer of ice on top of this snow, so it is absolutely treacherous out here. But do you see how our garden is out in the open? If you are brand new to gardening and you haven't picked out your garden spot yet, you need to know that for vegetable plants to grow well and be productive for you, they need at least six to eight hours of direct sun per day. So try to pick the sunniest spot you can. The other thing I want to mention is that if you already have a garden spot, take a look to see if trees and shrubs are maybe shading part of your garden. Maybe they've done a little extra growing in the last couple of years. And so you might need to do a little bit of pruning just to make sure your veggies are going to get plenty of sun. Now before you even think about planting a seed, it's really important that you are aware of your growing conditions in your region. It's very important to know when the last spring frost typically occurs and also when the first fall frost typically happens. And that way you know what the right timing is for planting things like cool season crops, so lettuce, spinach, broccoli, peas, that type of thing, or warm season crops like tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and zucchini. So this type of information is very important. Again, if you're new to gardening, take advantage of the knowledge of others around you. Maybe your neighbor's a great gardener, you have gardening friends, or contact your local Master Gardener program because they would be happy to share that information with you. Now, if you're curious about our conditions here in Spokane, we typically have the last spring frost, usually around the middle of May, and the first fall frost can occur somewhere from the middle of September to the end of September. Although, as we all know, things have really been varying quite a bit, and that makes it so important to follow the weather forecasts so you know what's coming your way. Now let's head back indoors because I have some useful tools to share with you to help you plan your garden. The first thing I wanted to show you is my seed starting scheduler. Now it's nothing fancy, but it helps keep me on track for knowing when to start seeds and when to transplant them out into the garden. I have two versions of this form on my website and you can just print it out and use it to help yourself stay on track. So let me show you where that is on my website. The first thing you want to do is go to susansinthegarden.com and then go to the guides menu. 
And as you work your way down, you'll notice there is something called a seed starting scheduler. Click on that. There's an introduction here that explains how it works and how I use it. And then you'll notice there are links to two different versions of the scheduler. This first one is the first version that I came up with. And so you use this column to put in the name of the crop and the name of the variety that you're going to grow. Then how many weeks before the last frost date that you should start the seeds, when you should plant them indoors, the actual date, and then when you should transplant them out into the garden if you're starting the seeds indoors. If you're going to sow the seeds directly in the garden, like let's say you're planting a bunch of radishes, this column is for the date that you would sow them directly into the garden. And sometimes I use this notes column to tell myself how many seedlings I want to end up with from starting them indoors. So that's what that's for. But you can use it for whatever you want. Now if I close this version, and go to the lower one, Seed Starting Scheduler 2023. Here we go. This one is just slightly different. This is how I think I want to use it from here on out. So again, this is going to be for the name of the crop and the variety that I've chosen. How many days it takes the crop to reach maturity. So when you get to pick fresh produce from your plants. So for example, how many days does it take to get a ripe tomato? And you'll find that on a seed packet. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Here is when I want to start my seeds indoors, and here is when I want to transplant outdoors. Or if I'm just going to direct sow the seeds in the garden, this is the date that I want to do that and then there's still a notes column. So the thing that's notably different about this form is that we have the days to maturity, and I thought that could help me with some other types of projects such as succession planting, which I'm not going to go into today. But print out whichever one you think will be helpful and you know just use it. It's a great tool. Again, it's very basic, but it really has worked for keeping us on track with our seed starting. And speaking of seed starting, I'm going to shoot a video on that very topic in two weeks, so be sure to look for that. I have another valuable tool on my website that I wanted to tell you about today. Again, go to my website, susansinthegarden.com, go to the guides menu, and just a little bit below the seed starting scheduler, you'll notice there are two links. This first one says seed starting, when to plant vegetables for all zones, and here is one for when to plant vegetables in zones five and six. So if you click on the first one for all zones, the way I created it is instead of giving you specific dates, it is in relation to your last spring frost. So here's one that says two weeks before the last spring frost, six weeks before the last spring frost, or after all danger of frost has passed. So more generic information as far as the timing. If you go to the second seed starting list where it says when to plant vegetables, zones five and six, if you go to that one, that has specific dates because I garden in zone 5-6 and so I was able to put in actual dates. So I hope these two tools will be very helpful for you as you plan out when you want to start seeds, whether it's indoors or planting them directly into the garden. You know, while we're on my website, I do have one other thing to tell you about that is a resource, and it's free. In the right-hand column on every page of my site, there is a form that you can fill in to subscribe to my free newsletter. It comes out twice a month, 
and it's filled with all kinds of information. It's gardening tips. A lot of times I'll feature a video that you might not know about. There's information on different types of insects you might encounter in the garden, both good ones and bad ones. I let you know what I'm up to in the garden and other interesting tips and tricks. So just go to the right hand column of any page on my website where it says subscribe to my newsletter. You have to fill in your email address and check the box that says I'm not a robot and then click on let's keep in touch. Now what's really important is that you will receive an email that says please confirm your subscription. You need to click on that link in order for me to know that you want a newsletter sent to you. Also, please do not sign up anybody else. I do not want the newsletter to go to people who aren't interested in having it sent to them. And it's a great way to make enemies if you sign somebody else up for something that they didn't ask for. So I'm trying to keep everybody happy, but a whole bunch of folks subscribe to it. They seem to really enjoy it. And so you might consider subscribing to my newsletter. If you're wondering how I know when to start seeds, in addition to those charts I made, you can find that information on seed packets. So let's look at one right now. It's really important to read the information on the seed packets so that you have good success at growing whatever it is you're planting. So this is from Renee's garden, and I have to say, they probably have the very best seed packets because there's so much information on them. I'm just going to flip it over, and first of all, it has background information about what you're growing. But if you flip open this little spot here, you'll notice that it says it's a half-hardy perennial. So depending upon your zone, it may come back year after year. I'm afraid our weather is a little bit too cold, although I can grow it with some protection. And you'll notice how it says, easiest to start outdoors. So you would direct sow these seeds out in your garden. And it tells you one quarter inch deep. I realize that's pretty small print there and to keep the seed bed evenly moist, that the seeds probably will germinate somewhere between one and two weeks. It tells you when you might want to thin them. Thinning is a method of removing certain plants within a row so that the ones that are remaining will have enough room to grow. And then here's some growing notes. The other things that they have on the seed packet that I think are great let me just zero in on that a little bit. There you go. Okay, look at this. Plant in February to April, August to September. You know, late in the season is a great time to grow some cool season crops because the temperatures will be cooler and they will do well for you and you'll get even more out of your garden. It says you can grow arugula in full sun or part day shade. Remember how I said earlier in this video, six to eight hours of sunlight daily for the majority of veggies, well, this one will tolerate a bit of shade, which is great to know. Planting depth, which was already on there, how far apart to space the seeds, how many days it takes them to germinate, and mature height. Now, let me get another seed packet to show you one more piece of information. So this is a seed packet of melons, and you'll notice this days to harvest information that I've underlined in red. In this case, this variety of cantaloupe takes about 75 to 80 days to produce a mature fruit that you can harvest and enjoy. Remember on my seed starting scheduler, I had a column for days to maturity. And I could put that in there just so I would have an idea of how much time this plant is going to need to be in one of my planting beds. And also the reason that this days to maturity information is important is because based on where you are growing, 
if you have a short season, you need to make sure that whatever you choose to grow in your garden that takes a long time, like melons or winter squash or pumpkins, will have enough time to grow and develop and mature. So that little piece of information is extremely important for those longer season crops. Here's another thing that I wanted to show you because I want you to consider creating a simple template that allows you to track where you're growing each type of vegetable. So here is an example of what I made for myself in Word and what I do is I print out a new copy every year and figure out where everything is going to be growing. You'll notice I have quite a lot of raised beds. <laughs> There are 27 of them all together, although they're really fairly small. Most of them are three feet wide by eight feet long. But having a template like this really makes it easy for me to plan where I want to plant everything. And the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about today is the importance of keeping a garden journal. You know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can have a binder full of some paper, you can have a notepad, or you can use an actual garden journal. The purpose of a garden journal is to jot down notes that will help you grow a great garden. Examples of the information you would jot inside include when you started your tomato seeds, when did you transplant them out into the garden, and when did you make that happy discovery of the first ripe tomato? And even how long the harvest lasted? Did you have an insect problem? And if so, what did you do about it? Was it successful or would you do something differently next time? Did you hear from a friend or a neighbor about a great new variety of a vegetable that you really want to grow? If you jot it down, you won't forget the name. Ask me how I know this. By keeping a journal, we all become better gardeners every single year. Well, that's everything for today. I'm trying to keep these videos to a manageable length so that you can quickly watch them and pick up some great tips. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. I am so excited about this year's growing season, and I'll bet you are too. I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.